times. But it was that first experience of humanity with a community in which I had never experienced before. And so then to be able to see his humanity allowed me to see Christ that resided in him and it opened me up to be ministered by him and to start to grow in, lack of a better word, most radical empathy that we see the face of Christ in those whom we're ministering and, and those who we serve, but those we disagree with. And how can I then be empathetic to those whom, who I struggle with? Welcome to Mamas in Spirit, a podcast pointing you towards God in everything you are and everything you do. I'm Lindy Wynn, and it's a blessing to be with you. Hello, everyone, and welcome to this Lenten podcast, this Lenten gathering, this Lenten mini retreat. We're always desiring to go deeply into our hearts and our lives and our souls to listen to the whisper of God, how God is calling each one of us. And I am so excited to be here with Tim Forbes today. Tim, thank you so much for joining (laughs) us. Thank you for having me. I'm really excited to be here. So I'm grateful for this opportunity. I am so excited to have you. And it's hysterical because my husband and I actually met Tim over Zoom when he was the principal of St. Matthew's Catholic School in the Nashville, Tennessee area before we ever moved to Tennessee. Yeah, I think during the pandemic. It was. Yes. Oh my goodness. It was. Yeah. So I'm grateful that you're having me on your podcast. And I will be honest, it is, it's a little intimidating, mamas in spirit and me having the obviously uh, uh, something not in common with with your typical audience member. Uh, So having the Y chromosome coming and presenting about my new ministry. (laughs) and talking about my my new ministry here. So, Yes, because you are the executive director of the Judge Dinkins Educational Center. That is correct, yes. Yes, and we're going to dive into all of that. But I do want to say of our seven Lenten podcasts, we have three males who are guests. (laughs) Yes, so I listened to Father John's podcast. So that was a little, uh, that put my mind a little at ease. That consoled you. That's right. God worked through that. That's right. Yes, praise God. And it's so funny. You can join us on YouTube. We're on YouTube now with my new sign and our new little little studio and we put on our headsets which look like we're taking off in planes but yet being a man Tim said I, I automatically went to a, a football coach and I feel like I should be giving this interview now with a play sheet in front of my face so that the opposing team can't read my lips yes yeah. so you're going to be coaching us towards God though <laughs> So in that spirit, in the Holy Spirit, will you open us in prayer? Absolutely. Begin in the name of the Father, Son, Holy Spirit. Amen. Amen. Heavenly and gracious Father, we give you thanks for this day. We give thanks for the opportunity during this Lenten journey to invite you to walk by our side. Lord, we ask for the continued gift of hope and that we may continue to have the courage to choose hope. Lord, we, we also ask that you continue to bless this ministry and may your word and your wisdom be heard throughout. In your Son's name we pray. Amen. Amen. Such a beautiful, beautiful prayer. And I love that you already talked about hope, Tim. (laughs) And I was not necessarily planning on sharing this, but I do want to share this before we enter into this story, because I am so excited about what you're about to share about, because I believe it's so deeply at the heart of the matter and the walk of Christ and the passion and the call to sacrificial love, because God, Jesus gave himself completely for us and out of love, love itself and for eternal life. And I believe what you're doing reflects that so beautifully. And I'm sure it's a messy walk. Any any vocation or any decision, it's it is always messy, and that that is why I think it's the importance to have hope. I read a theologian James Fowler a couple of years ago. He talked about faith being innate that that we all have faith in something, and he talked about love that that God is love, and he goes even even the atheist can't deny love. A, a, and then he said, but but hope. He goes he goes hopelessness is is possible. Hope needs to be a decision, and that it needs to be a conscious decision. And he goes in that leading us then to to love and faith. And that politician recently said that hope is not a, a destination, but it does give us fuel for the journey. It gives us and points us towards love and it points us towards God and it points us towards towards our, our faith or gives us a purpose for our faith. So so those three working in tandem uh, to develop who we are in our vocation. Yes. And I, and I do believe that through the story that you're about to share, that it shows that God provides hope and that fuel for the journey in every circumstance and that we're called to dig in deep in yeah. life and accompany one another and especially those who are most poor and vulnerable so that we can help hopefully reflect the hope (laughs) of God. So I'd love for you to start at the beginning of your journey. Oh oh my goodness. It's interesting because we talk about conversion and conversion of heart and conversion of story. And I I wouldn't necessarily say I had a a huge conversion experience, but I I one time had a friend talk about the difference between Paul and Timothy. And Paul on his way to Damascus had that instant conversion versus his disciple Timothy, who grew up in the faith and was brought along by his 
as his parents and arrived in ministry that way. And so I was fortunate, grew up in, in Middle Tennessee, grew up in actually the parish in which I was the principal for, for so many years. In 1978, my family was asked to leave their parish because it was growing too big, or at least that's what the pastor said. I always said it was my older brother. <laughs> that is, it was his behavior that we get, uh, we were thrown out of our parish and asked to join the new parish of, of St. Matthew. And through that, was involved in, in Catholic schools and then attended the Catholic high school. And when it became time to go to college, I, I was playing lacrosse at the time and received a letter from uh, Guilford College, small little liberal arts Quaker college in North Carolina. And I thought this will be the first of many recruiting letters I received to go play NCAA lacrosse. And if I were standing out by that mailbox uh, waiting for more letters, I'd still be standing by that mailbox. That that was the lone, lone letter I received. And it was a place where it gave me the opportunity to not only continue to play lacrosse, but I was invited up for a college visit. And when I went, it was very different from the experiences that I'd had growing up in a very Catholic community, very uh, conservative community. And the the school was was very liberal. And I thought that, that maybe this would be an interesting place for me to attend. And when I went there, I got involved with Catholic campus ministry. Uh, it was a student body of about 1,100 students. And there were about 10 of us that were in attendance at Mass uh, every Sunday. One of those people in attendance noticed, and she became a reason to continue to go back to Mass. And so we uh, uh, started dating at the end of my freshman year. And growing up, church was was never an option. We always went to Mass. Sunday would roll around, and there was no such thing as a traveler's dispensation. I can remember we did a road trip to Wyoming as a family in the minivan and pulling off on the side somewhere in God knows where uh, and, and attending church. That was a part of our family's makeup. Uh, and so when I went to college, that that continued. And so being engaged in campus ministry, regardless of, of what was going on in my life, it centered me. It grounded me. And that Sunday night, 7 o'clock, Founders Hall, I knew exactly where I'd be because that was just a part of what we did. And so as I was dating this this young lady, we were talking about our future and started talking about what we wanted to do. And at one point I said, you know, I think I'd like to do to do missionary work. And she said, yeah, yeah, you know, me, me too. And that, that kind of stayed in the back of our minds and every now and then would come up in discussion. And my senior year, I was going home to my second floor of my apartment. And on the first floor were four girls who lived right below me and my three roommates. And there was a sign on their door that said, do you want to be a missionary? Now, this was the days before the internet. And so the way in which you received information was by bulletin boards and little tear-off information pieces that you would then have either a, a phone number or a mailing address. And this, this in fact, had a phone number. And so the sign said, do you want to be a missionary? And then it had about 15 little tear-offs uh, with a, a phone number. I didn't know for what church, didn't know anything about it. And the girls who lived below me weren't Catholic. And so I was definitely in intrigued and I kept that piece of paper in my desk drawer for the second semester of my entire senior year. Graduate, my wife and I, or my girlfriend at the time, we worked at a Christian camp in Charleston, South Carolina. And as the summer was winding down, I had a botched opportunity, a missed opportunity on my part to go into my, at the time, field of study, journalism and politics in, in Somerville, South Carolina. And so I then took that piece of paper and I said, well, maybe now's the time. And so we talked about it, prayed about it, called the number, and it was for the Trinitarian Missionary Organization, a Catholic group out of the Northeast. And they sent us the paperwork. In that paperwork, you have to do quite a bit because they, they want to make sure that you're well-adjusted and able to handle the demands of, of the mission field. And it said, where do you want to work? And we put Central America, South America. And then it said, domestically, where would you like to go? And we put the West. Both of our families are on the, the East Coast. And so I would like to experience something different. And I said, where don't you want to work? And I put New England. I didn't want to go there. It's cold. I have family in New England. And I thought, I'm good. And then it said, what would you like to do? How would you like to serve? And put teaching. And then I thought, well, construction, that would be interesting. And then some type of work with youth. And then it said, what don't you want to do? And I, I wrote homelessness, work with the, the homeless population. When I was at Guilford, being a, a Quaker school and very involved in social justice, I had to do 50 50 hours of service learning to graduate. All of my hours were done with the homeless population and the homeless community. And I thought it was a good experience, but I wanted something new. Well, the Trinitarians invited us to a retreat in Connecticut and they said, um, we've got good news for you. We have a placement for an unmarried couple. I'm like, this is this is great. All right. Yeah, I think I think we're in. They're like, it's in Boston. I'm like, wow, that's New England, which is where we said we didn't want to go. And I'm like, I, I don't think they read my application. And then they said, working at a soup kitchen. And I'm like, ah, the homeless population. I'm 
like they certainly didn't read our, our application. But it was the very first time where I had to make a, a major life decision outside of where I was going to go to college, where we had to depend on, on God and just hand, hand this over to God. So we, we were saying, God, we're, we're willing to serve. We're willing to commit our lives, but we'll do it only if it is where we want to go, doing what, what we want to do. And God was like, no, I, I'm going to do the exact opposite. And it turned out to be an incredible year. I lived in a rectory with four priests and my wife lived in a home and staffed a home for developmentally disabled women. And it was a year where we continually had to put us and our relationship subservient to God. And as we approached marriage, uh, when we were at the retreat in Connecticut, I don't remember anything about the retreat. I, I don't remember any of the speakers, but I do remember uh, Father Dennis uh, giving a long talk, God bless him, and, and it bled over into our lunch hour on the retreat. And I remember being being hangry and Father Dennis finally wrapping up his talk and then everybody beelining for the kitchen to have lunch. And Father Dennis just gently said, if anybody would like to go to the Sacrament of Reconciliation, I'm going to offer that now. And my uh, a girlfriend and I were walking to uh, the kitchen and I look in where Father Dennis was sitting and I look around and no one was there. And I thought, I'll, I'll go to Reconciliation. And in fact, I said, this will take a couple minutes. I'll go ahead. Just let me, uh, just let me go. I'll go to Reconciliation. If you wouldn't mind waiting for me so I'm not sitting alone at lunch. And she said, sure. And so I went into to reconciliation and somewhere between the door and sitting down, I made the decision that I will never see this priest ever again in my life. Uh, we're in Connecticut. He is uh, doing ministry in Alabama. The odds of our paths crossing slim to none. And I'm like, I'm just going to let it go. And uh, I, I don't know if you've ever seen the movie Goonies, where Chunk is uh, told to, to say everything. And he does. And he's, he's sitting there crying and talking about fake throw up and going over the balcony. And that was what my reconciliation was. I let it all out, told him everything and anything that that was was on my, my heart. And it was two hours. He was as patient as any human being. And I had tears and, and it was a profound experience. And finally, when I got up and left, my girlfriend had been, been waiting for me. She's like, do, do we need to talk? Are, are you okay? And I was like, yes, better, better than ever. And then with the thing that I learned in pragmatism, as much as our church deals in the, the mystery and the supernatural and the, the metaphysics, there's sometimes so much pragmatism in its application to our humanity that that sacrament of reconciliation was so cathartic for me. And to have a priest say, you are forgiven. There's a God who loves you. You are forgiven. And this priest who I never thought I would see again, there was so much trust there that we asked him to celebrate our marriage, that he was whom... He is who we wanted to marry us. And so that time in Boston, then continuing to lean on on the Sacrament of Reconciliation, serving the, the poor and the, the vulnerable, had a profound impact on me in that letting go and, and allowing God to, I don't know, allowing God to, uh, to work through us and, and handing over our weaknesses to God and allowing God to work through that. Then knew that I I'd eventually wanted to work with youth and we moved back to Charleston, South Carolina, which is where she was from. We uh, were married and I worked for a shelter for abused and ab abandoned children. And at that time, I felt like God really putting on my heart, working with the vulnerable. And it was a, it was a humbling experience, knowing what these children ha ha had gone through. A and it was also amazing to see their resilience, but also then knowing that the support that a child needs in order to be successful and transition into to young adulthood. And so it, it was really at that moment where I thought, this is going to be my calling that I'm going to continue to work with youth in, in some capacity throughout my career. And so got involved in the Diocese of Charleston, uh, involved in, in youth ministry, involved in, in high school ministry in, in Charleston, and uh, started working on my master's degree. And funny enough, working with a, a principal at Cardinal Newman High School in Columbia, South Carolina, he had shared that he was moving to a high school that he'd like to continue to help with our project, but he was transitioning to a high school in Nashville called Father Ryan, which is where I went. And he said, now, have you ever heard of it? I said, believe it or not, I have. Uh, so I followed him up about eight months later and worked in administration at, at Father Ryan for about nine years and working with high school ministry there. Transitioning then to leadership in Catholic schools was a principal for another eight years. And it was an amazing experience, but continued to feel that there was a calling to work with youth who may not have the support systems that the students at the elementary school where I was had. And how could we be a a 
a people of hope and how can we provide hope? And reading Greg Boyle and, and Dietrich Bonhoeffer, Boyle talks about we go to the margins, not to bring Christ to the margins, but Christ is there. We go to, to find Christ in the margins. And Bonhoeffer talking about his time in the United States and the experiences that he had in the Harlem churches really had an impact on me. And I thought if I'm ever going to leave education and start something new and, and work with disadvantaged youth, troubled youth, at-risk youth, that now is the time. Still have time in my career and uh, still excited about working with young people and have the energy to do so. And so after much prayer and discernment, my wife and I talked about uh, me leaving schools and going to the Judge Dinkins Educational Center. Can you share with everybody the population that the Judge Dinkins Educational Center works with? Our mission statement is at-risk youth. And right now it is a pre-vocational, pre-construction, pre-apprenticeship program for kids who have been adjudicated through the courts. So it's, it's kids who are justice involved and they will then come to our facility. So we have yet to have students and we plan to open our facility in August of 2024. Yes, praise God. So Tim, I noticed when you're sharing your story and you're talking about all these different experiences you've had, you talked about abused and abandoned children. You talked about the homeless Mm -hmm. and the hungry being at the soup kitchen. And then now you're talking about children that are for some reason caught up in the juvenile justice system. Mm -hmm. And these are all human beings. Yes. And these are children, very vulnerable children. And many of you listening know that my husband and I are adoptive parents. And our first two, we adopted from foster care at six and three. And they had very dynamic backgrounds and had experienced so many different things that you would never want children to experience. And so I'm going to imagine a lot of the children that you're working with or who you have worked with have experienced great poverty, great homelessness, maybe neglect at times. We talked about abandonment, abuse. So can you talk? about when you talked about that quote and the readings that you've done about really experiencing Christ, like going to the margins, but finding Jesus there, not necessarily bringing Jesus, but finding Jesus there. Quick side story. A time that really changed my life was in Tijuana, Mexico. And part of it was during a service immersion trip and we went to the dump. And I remember that these people lived in the dump and worked in the dump. And I remember standing to serve food, even though I was being served mercy and love and clarity and discernment that I never could have imagined by the Lord in that moment. And I just remember looking at this one man that I have never seen again and seeing Christ in him, seeing the face of Christ in him. And actually a recent podcast guest, Susan, gave me a rosary that has the face of Christ on it, like from the veil of Veronica. And that touched me so deeply because I'm a convert to Catholicism. And so I don't know all the things. I feel like I'm always learning, but I guess we all are with the (laughs) over 2000 years of history in the Catholic. The church, but I loved it when she gave me that because she also talked about seeing the face of Christ in every human person, and that's what I'm hearing in you. Yeah. And when you talk about a draw and a call, like that's deep. Yeah, that's deep. How did you experience that? Like, what have you experienced, and with whom? Oh wow, have you experienced? We'll go back to the class at Guilford and my experiences at Guilford, working with the, the homeless population. And 21 years old, and we were asked then to perform hours of of service. And there's a part of the homeless community. And what I, in my experiences at Boston, learned that 33% of those who are homeless only need emergency services uh, for a short period of time. Another 33% will need services for less than two years. So two thirds of the community is is transient and will take advantage of the private and the faith-based and government services that that are offered. Uh, The other two third will, will always need services either because of mental illness, addiction. And when I was at Guilford, we were challenged to explore all the various aspects of homelessness. And so my partner and I, who is the quarterback of the football team, were involved in those struggling with addiction. And we went out into the to the homeless camps and uh, would, would work with and provide food and serve food in the, the homeless camps. And we got to know one of the, the guests, his name was, was, was James. And uh, Santis was incredible with James and, and the way in which 
which he would sit and listen to James was incredible. And so the the opportunity to see James as a human and start to develop empathy and recognize his need and his desire to be seen and his desire to be to be loved. That here we are, two goofy college kids coming into his home, and he uh, he was so excited to to see us and greet us. And we would spend a Monday night, a Tuesday night at his place. And it got to the point where Santis, who had an apartment by himself, uh, had James over and would have dinner with James. And Santis stayed in the Greensboro area and kept in touch with with James. But it was that first experience of humanity with a community in which I did not, I had never experienced before. And so then to be able to see his humanity uh, allowed me to see his, the Christ that resided in him. And it opened me up to be ministered by him and to start to grow in lack of a better word, almost radical empathy that we see the face of Christ in those whom we're ministering and and those who we serve, but those we disagree with. And how can I then be empathetic to those whom, who I struggle with? How can I be empathetic to those that I struggle with? I love what you're saying so much. And what I'm hearing from you, Tim, is that you saw the face of Christ in James Mm -hmm. and also in watching Santis, like that encounter between them. It almost reminds me a little bit of the woman at the well, where the woman comes and she's carrying so much with her and she's avoiding all the people because of all of her shame and her guilt and coming in the middle of the day and then she meets mercy himself she meets Christ himself and so in some way that you were experiencing that dynamic with both of them and some people might think this is kind of inappropriate but I do want to ask this because there was a woman who's homeless Charlie Voss who was in a podcast about a year and a half ago in the Advent season in the end of season four and she talks about being in the homeless shelter the National rescue mission yeah. at night with a cell phone, which I've often joked before, like everybody has a cell phone, but she has her cell phone that's lit up in the dark, yeah. which the light always outshines the darkness and she's praying. And we have children and one child in particular that really struggled. Like I feel like if we had not really honed in on hygiene and all the things, even like the state of his bedroom, yeah. I mean, it was pretty extreme. Like we had hoarding of food and old yeah. food we'd find and like bugs and all the things just to be honest with everybody listening. (laughs) like, So I think about the homeless shelter and like what the smells are like, what the space is like, what that closeness is, even in the discomfort of it. And then all the different choices that are being made by different people and even the lack of safety, all the things that are going on. So with James, I think about James being invited into Santis' home for a meal. I mean, how beautiful. And I'm going to imagine that it wasn't all pleasant. Yeah, uh, it wasn't. Hygiene was was an issue, but at the same time, Santis accepted James for who he was, not who Santis felt he needed to be. And so, I, I am not a fan of the expression "we meet people where they are," but rather we not only meet where they are, but we've got to, to roll up our sleeves and put on our shoes and walk with them. And Santis was a great example of that for me, of really accepting James for who he was, and and so that was such a beautiful thing. And I scored three goals, collegiate goals in lacrosse. I did not have a prolific collegiate career, but I scored in one game my senior year and I heard somebody going nuts in the stands. And there were probably 15 people at a division three lacrosse game. And when I looked up, it was Santis and James. Nobody was ever happier for me in, in my athletic endeavors than James was that afternoon. It was really touching and something that, that I will never forget. And so the, the friendship that was there was authentic. It was genuine. And I think that was the other thing that, that I was able to witness with Santis and James by accepting him for who he was, it gave James permission to be vulnerable and to talk about addiction and to talk about alcoholism. And so we had some pretty heavy conversations, but it started with Santis saying, it doesn't matter past, we're here now and who you are now is someone whom I want to be involved with. Yes, that made me tear up when you talked about the stands. And I think some of that is, is because it sounds like you were touched by the purity of love. (laughs) Yes. Yes. Yeah. And I think when we enter into those experiences, we have the opportunity to experience an an authentic God, a God who loves us greatly and and is willing to meet us, walk with us. And and I think of sometimes the suffering in our lives. Sometimes I think that is an abandonment and rather God is saying, no, love and suffering are not mutually exclusive, but you can have the two together and I'm I'm with you throughout. And it's a, a tool and not a 
punishment, that suffering is something that you can use and something that I love you. And it's, it's not, I'm not punishing you because of it, but something that you can grow from. Yes. I love what you're saying. And I feel like in my own life, Tim, I've learned that when I have chosen essentially to suffer with another, that I have learned the true meaning of love yeah. and what love is and that intimacy and depth that's really inexplicable and that we can't really touch on in, that's right. in words. I so appreciate everything that you're sharing, Tim. And there's something in all of this that then drew you to continue this kind of walk to accompany others that are really struggling in really extreme ways and that willingness to do that because of that touch of love that you witnessed and that you saw yourself because you talked about loving someone and accepting someone and walking with someone exactly where they are without necessarily what I'm hearing is trying to change someone because God changes and God transforms and through God's love. And so I think about this because I'm also thinking about this in regards to my own experience of like loving my child, you know, my child that everything can't always be fixed and everything can't always be changed. And here you are now really taking this experience. It's like there's many James in a way that that you've chosen to leave to make this major transition in your life. And I could be wrong, but I feel like I've got a little bit of this going on right now. So I want to know, Tim, (laughs) is that even doing all this other work that you've been doing, which is so meaningful and God's been shaping you and forming you through leadership in these different schools, Father Ryan, St. Matthew's, is that there's something back deep within you that still feels very called to walk with the most poor and the most vulnerable and that you know that God is guiding you there. Is that correct? And I think that is that call to hope and to decide and to choose hope and continue to choose hope. And the students whom are justice involved, 75 to 80 percent of them have trauma or some type of mental health issue in their background. And so to be able to work at a a facility that can then give them a career path, give students a career path, as well as deal with the trauma that they've experienced, the the mental health issues that they're suffering with, is to then provide, be able to provide hope and and to choose to choose that. Yes. And I would like to point out, because I really feel this way, Tim, is that you're opening everybody's hearts and lives to the hope of God, really, the the resurrection, the Easter Sunday after great experience of, I would say, I keep calling them small P passions for better or worse. Like there's Jesus's passion and that is the passion. Yet that gives us a roadmap and a blueprint of how to engage in life. And like you're saying, accompany one another in our own kind of trials and journeys on these pilgrimages of life. And I wasn't sure if I was going to share this or not, but I am going to share it. So before recording this podcast today, I went to this insanely difficult exercise class because my girlfriend goes to it. And I love her. So I'm like, great, I get to exercise with her. (laughs) Today, it was particularly hard and it's called, it's boot camp. And it was very, very difficult. Like the air was thick in there today because we live in Tennessee with bipolar weather. And so (laughs) in the changes of weather, it was particularly messy and slippery today and all the things. So I bring this up because so unexpectedly, this woman that I've never met, never seen before came up to me when we were like getting weights before class. And I don't even know why she decided to tell me this, but she talked talked about not being able to get pregnant. Oh, wow. And she doesn't know me at all. And she doesn't know that I'm a mother through adoption or any of the things. And to be really honest with you, hoping and assuming she will never listen to this podcast, I wasn't totally sure about her mental health through this conversation. I've sat with a lot of people over the years and things of the sort, but I'm listening to her and just kind of, I noticed Christ in this moment, like this is a Christ moment. And then she says to me, after I tell her that I've adopted children, she basically tells me, I don't want to do that. She's like, because I've looked up on Google and those children tend to have broken marriages and have greater of the things, yeah, whatever sure. the things are. Yeah. And there was a lack of hope there. Yeah. Like you're touching on that. And I think that this is reflective of what we're talking about because some of these situations in life could seem so far gone. Like we had Tara Noel in an earlier Lenten podcast who she went to rehabilitation at a program, a glorious program that was named in honor of St. Maria Goretti. And they didn't take many people younger than 30 because there's less hope after 30 because people are so set in their yeah, ways. Yes. But they took Tara, right? And and her life was transformed yeah. through this experience. Yet what I'm hearing from you and maybe from my own experience, so I want to know what you think, Tim, is like you are going into situations that some people may think are hopeless, mm-hmm. but you believe so deeply in the hope of the Lord yeah. and that God can transform things and that with God, all things truly are possible that you're willing to do it. And last thing about boot camp, I used to always joke with 
people from my own experience of raising our older children from foster care and all their trauma and all the things we're really touching on today, I would tell people it was like boot camp for the Lord. Yeah. Like I wouldn't be here having this conversation if I wasn't for many years alone in my home during the day with my children that were grappling in ways that many people yeah. can fathom and many cannot yeah. unless you've been there, <laughs> right? Yeah. Like, but, but that taught me about the kind of perseverance and hope and love that only God can provide. And I also think as Catholic Christians that made in the divine image of God, that every, every individual, regardless of mental health, that socioeconomics, that they reflect or embody the love of God and that it is our responsibility to care for that and to nurture that and to go and provide hope that they may not in those hopeless situations as a community, what can we do to serve others? Just because they are not, uh, individuals may not be in our backyard, we may not have connections with the homeless. It does not for me in my walk, it doesn't exonerate me from my call to serve just because I don't see them or I don't come and experience in my day to day, then how do I then go out to the margins? How do I go and seek that out? And part of that being my calling and my responsibility, knowing that the, the challenges that are there. But as we've been talking about Lent, as you talk about the resurrection, we can't have the resurrection without the cross. And I think of the transfiguration where Jesus is up on the mountaintop. He has his most faithful there and Moses and Elijah are there and they have the transfiguration and there. The, the disciples come down off the mountain and they're so excited and they think this is it. The kingdom of God is, is at hand. They've just seen these two great prophets along with the son of man. And they're like, this is it. And it's then Jesus says, oh, no, no, uh, the son of man has to suffer. And that, that kind of throws Peter for a loop. He's like, no, no, you don't. And so it becomes easy to think that we can have the glory without the cross. And scripture continually tells us that, that that's, or reminds us that that's, that's not the case, that we have to experience the cross in order to see the resurrection. And so in order for growth, sometimes we have to experience pain and that that's not fun. And I always want a spiritual Advil to dull the pain and numb the pain, but also knowing that growth will come as a result of whatever struggle I'm, I'm having. I also think that in, in these circumstances that a calling to help, then the resurrection, the experience that we have with young people that dealing with trauma uh, will be great. We'll, we'll have to experience the cross and experience some difficulties. Uh, and there's, there's always the unknowns, but through that we experience the resurrection. And what I find most frustrating with, with our God is it may not be on my timeline and I may never know that or never see it, but I have to understand and have faith that it is on, on his and, and his plan. And that's the other piece of this process with ministry is it has nothing to do with me <laughs> you know? mm -hmm. and, and that it is about God's ministry and God's plan and simply to use me and that I may never see the fruits of that labor. And I have to be okay with that and I have to hand that off in faith. Yes. I love what you're saying because love does require a full abandonment of self and a full self-giving yeah. without expectation. Yes. <laughs> it's well said. Yes. It's true. Yeah. And anyone right. who's listening who's a parent yeah, that's right. <laughs> or that's really right. who's who's loved another yeah. or, or loved another who's grappled or struggled, whether in personal life or who's gone out. Yeah. And I really do love what you're saying, Tim. And I, I really think this is a beautiful invitation for all of us in this Lenten season to examine our lives and yeah. to examine our hearts and and to really look at the ways that God may be drawing us to walk with those who are on the fringes, for lack of a better yeah. way to put it. I always get nervous using words at this day and age because people are so <laughs> critical of words. Yeah. But like, really, you get what I'm saying. Yeah. I, but, yeah. And, and, and part, and I, I can I can appreciate that. And what I what I try and do is is bring the best self, most educated self. And, and I I can't do any better than that. And so we use the the words that we know, trying to be compassionate and empathetic to another. But other people's offenses, to my best intention, I can't I can't control. Control that. Thank uh, you for saying that. Yeah. I need to hear that. <laughs> I can't, I can't, that there's, <laughs> no one's gotten upset with me or yeah, anything, but yeah. I'm always like trying to be so choosy and careful with my words. But it's like, oh, God is so much bigger than this. Yeah, <laughs> yes. And, and uh, if, if someone misperceives my intention or my desires, pure heart. I, 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 uh, I would like to think I have a, a pure heart, but no, I uh, am a sinner. As, um, we but, all are. But, but at the same time, it's okay. We're doing the best that we can. And the grace that we ask another person for us. Uh, when, when we misuse words or somehow offend them, we need to give the same grace and know that, that that is how we start to recognize the humanity in one another. Yes. And then how we can grow as a community. Yes. Thank you so much for sharing that. And I'm going to imagine when you enter into all of these different communities and environments, it's so funny because culturally it's so different and all the verbiage that's used <laughs> and all the things like things that we may take for total granted of appropriateness yeah. or whatever, yeah. but it's like, it doesn't even matter. Like Christ is so much bigger than yeah. all of that. Yeah. And like you said, finding Christ in every human person yeah. and being in it. And I have never offended anybody by 
listening. That, that's the other piece that I, I, I need to remember is that <laughs> oh, uh, I've never upset anybody when, when I've kept my mouth closed. When you're present. That's right. Yes. You're pastoral. Uh, it, yes. Yeah. And, and just underestimate the power of just showing up and just, just being, just being present. Just being mm-hmm. there. That's right. I love that so much. I love that. I even think about like senior homes. We took the Girl Scouts to a senior home recently and it's just, just being there. Yeah, that's it's right. like the delight of their heart. Yes, Tim, I cannot thank you enough. And how can everybody learn more about the Judge Dinkins Educational Center and what you're doing to either one support it in vivo in person right. <laughs> if they live yeah. in the yeah. Nashville, Tennessee area, yeah. or financially support it? Because I do want to say, like, we we live in a world where we and this is not to bring up guilt or anything like that, but just we consume a lot. You know, there's yeah. a lot of things. Yet there's programs that can help shape, form, and transform form hearts and lives. And sometimes we need to know really wonderful places where faithful people are trying to do their best to to discover Christ sure. and go to to all of these different yeah. places and spaces. So how can we do that? that that's great. I, I think that there are a couple of things that, that individuals can do. One is is we, we will need volunteers. As any startup nonprofit, we need volunteers to serve as mentors, to serve on advisory boards. If individuals have a or are aware of construction companies, we will need students who who can then go into pre-apprentice, especially subcontractors, as our eventual goal is to have these young people move into the trades, electrical, plumbing. Another is obviously financial. Our website is jdecnash.org. We are very fortunate right now that we are privately funded, 100% privately funded. And the other are, or is, is to get involved also um, uh, in the, the political process. I think that there's so much of juvenile justice that happens that we we are unaware of. It doesn't impact our communities, it doesn't impact, it may not impact my family, but impacts the greater community. And so to, to get involved and to know what's what's happening in juvenile justice and in that space. There's a great website, uh, the Office of Juvenile Justice and Delinquency Prevention, OJJDP.org, which has a lot of national information about juvenile justice. And our, our state, there's a organization in Shelby County, down in Memphis, working with the University of Tennessee, Tennessee Mental Health and Sciences, the Youth Advocacy Committee to get involved there and to learn what some of the things that they're doing there. Yes, thank you so much. And thank you for pointing out earlier too, just the high percentage of children who are caught up in the juvenile system have histories of trauma. That's right. I think that's so important for all of us to know. And these are children. We're that's talking right. about children mm-hmm. and we're adults and we're called to help the children and the children first. And sometimes it's so much in my heart because there's so much noise in this world and people want to be so seen yeah. and in yeah. the online world and in all the places and spaces really but really we're called to care for the children and the children first and to direct our energy to that yeah well thank you very much for uh, for having me this was it was a lot of fun so I appreciate you allowing me to come and share a little bit about the Judge Dinkins Educational Center it's been a pleasure and a blessing and thank you for all that you and everyone involved are doing it's a true inspiration and I know that it's a calling and it's it's a living witness and testimony so thank you for that thank you can you close us in prayer absolutely Heavenly Father we ask that uh, you continue to allow this podcast to exist, allow your ministry to, to thrive. We also ask that you watch over the poor, the vulnerable, those who are struggling today, that they may know your love. And for those who have the ability to minister, to serve, to care, that you give them the courage they need uh, and the witness they need to, to fulfill what you have called them to become. In your son's name we pray. Amen. Amen. Right. Father, Son, Holy Spirit. Tim, thank you so much. Thank you. Thank Thank you everyone for being here. It is always a delight and a blessing to be on this pilgrimage and this journey together. Know that you can go to mamasinspirit.com for many more faithful podcasts and please share this podcast. And also if you are listening to this and you live in the Nashville, Tennessee area, please share it a whole bunch (laughs) so that people can learn about this beautiful ministry and how Tim and so many others are trying to help these very vulnerable children and teenagers. And may we all respond to that call to accompany and to walk with hopefully reflecting and emanating the love of Christ. Can't wait to be together again next time. This is Lindy Wynn with Mamas in Spirit. May God bless you and yours always.